When I was a kid, a title showdown at Suzuka was something you hoped to see at the end of every season. When Adelaide was dropped at the end of the 1995 season and then replaced with Melbourne at the start of the 1996 season, it meant that I saw four title showdowns at Suzuka in five years. 1996, 1998, 1999 and 2000. Obviously not 1997 because that was at Hereth. And while the 1997 season had ended in one of the most controversial ways possible, along with 1990 and 1994, the 1998 season seemed to be a bit better in terms of the whole not finishing with Formula 1 occupying the back pages of the newspapers type of thing. And sitting down to watch the race replay on ITV that afternoon was awesome, knowing that you weren't going to see the race result as a notification on your phone or on social media because, well, smartphones and social media didn't exist in 1998. And it was up in arms as to who Michael Schumacher's opponent or opponents would be going into this season, because Williams had lost Adrian Newey to McLaren and had also lost Works Renault engines, running Mechachrome branded 1997 engines in their place, and a 1997 car that was basically adapted to the new rules regarding narrow track and groove tyres. But after the first two rounds of the season, it was McLaren that showed it was back, absolutely obliterating the competition thanks to their second brake pedal that was banned after the Brazilian Grand Prix. Goodyear also changed their tyre construction for Argentina, and that and the band brake pedal allowed Ferrari to get back into the mix. The Goodyear tyres seemed to be better on twisty tracks like Buenos Aires, while the Bridgestones seemed to be better, well, almost everywhere else. So pretty much the inverse of 1997 really. But it meant that Hakkinen would still win four of the opening six races. Schumacher won in Buenos Aires with those upgraded Goodyear tyres, and Coulthard would win at Imola and it was his only win of that 1998 season. After Monaco, Schumacher won the next three races at Montreal, Manicourt and Silverstone, the latter being quite controversial as he'd done so in the pit lane, crossing the start finish before stopping in his box. After some back and forth, he was allowed to keep the win and the points, and in doing so had closed the points gap to just two points thanks to Hakkinen not finishing at Canada. Canada was also controversial for Michael. Coming out of the pits, he dived across the track to the racing line and pushed Frentzen off at high speed, for which he copped a penalty. While coming back through the field, Damon Hill started weaving on the back straight to block the Ferrari. After the race, Michael then accused Damon of dangerous driving. Damon didn't seem too bothered though, saying something to the press like, I'm getting lectures on dodgy driving for Michael Schumacher. Okay. Hakkinen bounced back by winning in Austria, which was another semi-controversial race given that the FIA actually prohibited teams from having a driver deliberately slow down by several seconds a lap to allow another driver to catch up. During this race, Schumacher had gone off at the final corner and damaged his car bouncing across the gravel, and teammate Eddie Irvine slowed down with brake issues to lose something like 5 seconds a lap and get the Michael back into third. Other points of the season that were important to the title race include the Hungarian Grand Prix, one of Michael's better drives, where he banged in qualifying laps for the vast majority of the race to get the win, while Hakkinen was only 6th. In those days, a win was 10 points, and there was just 1 point for 6th. And then there was the Belgian Grand Prix where Hakkinen was tipped out at the restart, and Schumacher and Coulthard collided in the spray. Then there was the Italian Grand Prix where Hakkinen was just 4th thanks to brake trouble. Hakkinen would pull it out of the bag when he needed to at the Nürburgring, managing to win the race from Schumacher, so this all set up a nice title showdown for the Japanese Grand Prix. Schumacher chasing title number 3, and Hakkinen chasing title number 1. It was a one race shootout for glory, but the odds still favoured Hakkinen to an extent. Reason being, if Schumacher won the race and Mika was in second, Hakkinen was still the winner due to him having more second places that year. Michael either needed Hakkinen to retire, which in those days was quite common and had been something that had affected McLaren a few times that year, or get teammate Eddie Irvine in between himself and the McLaren. And Schumacher did have one advantage in this case. Eddie knew Suzuka like the back of his hand and often ran well there. So all Mika, in theory, had to do was shadow the Michael. And Michael drew first blood on Saturday afternoon, setting the pole time with a 136.293, nearly two tenths ahead of the McLaren. Coulthard, meanwhile, was a second off the pace of Schumacher, but crucially was ahead of Eddie Irvine to prevent the Ferrari wingman from blocking Mika. Frentzen and Villeneuve were the best of the rest, with HHF only marginally off Irvine's time, and looking down to the bottom, you can see how spread the field was in those days. Esteban Tuero in the Minardi, six seconds off with Rossett not even qualifying in Tyrrell's final ever Grand Prix. 
There's an unconfirmed story here that the reason Rossett failed to qualify is due to him hurting his neck after riding the roller coaster next to the track, which affected his performance. So watching this as an 8 year old back in 1998, this was tense as anything. We didn't have the race spoiled for us through social media or the internet before watching the race replay. You could spoil it for yourself if you went on to see facts though, but that's not fun. Plus, even though I'm a Williams fan, I did have a soft spot for McLaren at that time. Maybe because, you know, I was eight and I was attracted to how the McLaren was painted in the silver and black West livery that they had at that time. Plus, Mika Hakkinen and David Coulthard were the dream team. They were together for such a long time. The five red lights came on to start the race. The revs built and then the yellow lights and flags appeared as Jarno Trulli was seen waving his arms about to signal that he'd stalled the car. Now this wouldn't happen today thanks to things like anti-stall bringing the thing back into neutral to keep the engine ticking over and giving the driver the chance to pull the clutch in and get back into first, but in those days it was one chance and one chance only. You would often see cars stalling in the pit lane as they pulled away from their pit boxes. I remember Martin Brundle doing a demo, I think it was that very year, demonstrating the different ways cars could get off the line. There was the granny pulling away from the lights where you just had enough revs to feed the clutch in but you ran the risk of stalling. Then there was the middle ground where you had to be careful with the clutch to not let it stall but also be careful with your right foot to keep the tyres from spinning. And then there was full Halfords car park boy racer. Looked awesome but it shredded your tyres. So as per the rules, Trulli was sent to the back and the cars would go around and do another formation lap. And as they pulled up to the grid slots again, everything was getting ready. It was like, right, we're going to have another start. The race is going to happen. And then the yellow flags started coming out again. And you see Schumacher with his hand in the air. If you find a full broadcast, it's worth watching because you can see how animated everybody was after Schumacher's car had conked out. One of those everyone is Jean Todd, who was marching very quickly in what appeared to be the direction of the steward's office. Now whether Max Mosley was there or not, I don't know, but I do recall Murray Walker and Martin Brundle saying something to the effect of, if he thinks he's going to be allowed to keep his car there, he can think again. If Jarno has to go to the back, Michael has to go to the back. And if you look at the onboard from Mika's car at the start of the race, because it showed the onboard looking towards turn one, you can see Schumacher just to the left of shot. Just before it cuts away to the rest of the grid, you actually see Schumacher's car just go like that as he pulls first gear. So it could be assumed that, you know, the clutch slipped. And this could be due to the way that the two championship contenders were tended to when the first start was aborted. When Trulli's car stalled and the crews were allowed back on the grid to push cars back to their grid slots because Coulthard, Ralph and a couple of others had actually moved, Mika's mechanics were on the scene in seconds and were lobbing dry ice and those giant hairdryer nozzles into the side pods to cool everything down. And they did that on Mika's and David's cars. The Ferrari mechanics meanwhile stood there and did nothing to tend to Schumacher's car. So it's thought that his car was just too hot. So when he pulled the clutch in and plucked first, the clutch slipped and that was it. Those clutches were only really designed to do one start. You dump it, you do the race, you have a couple of pit stops and then after that it's lobbed in the bin. Anything after that was basically RNG on whether it would survive a second start. So as per the rules Schumacher was sent to the back of the grid and at the third time of asking the field managed to get away off the line cleanly. Coulthard was a bit slow though and he'd been modded by Frentzen and Irvine into turn one, Irvine slotting in behind Hakkinen and Frentzen in third. So Coulthard wasn't able to help Hakkinen as you know, McLaren would have hoped he would have been able to help Mika but it was good for Ferrari. Irvine just needed to then get past Hakkinen and block so that Schumacher could catch up. And speaking of Schumacher, he'd blown by three cars by the time he'd even got to the start-finish line and then just started picking everybody off one by one over the course of the lap. And that just shows how big the spread of pace of the cars back then really was. Michael was 12th by the end of the first lap and then picked off another couple of drivers to then be in behind his brother. His brother moved aside and now he was on the back of his best friend in the whole wide world, Damon Hill who was in turn behind another one of Schumacher's friends, Jacques Villeneuve. And because they were all such good mates and Michael had a title to win, they also let him through. Wait, no, hang on a minute, that's not right. Um, they raced him. He had the 1994-1995 champion in 7th, the 1996 champion in 6th, and the 1997 champion in 5th. 
and all fighting each other. Villeneuve keeping Damon behind and Damon keeping Michael behind. In those days, remember, points went to 6th, so Damon was fighting JV and since Michael was on the same lap, he saw no reason to let him through for the points. And Jordan was fighting Benetton for 4th in the Constructors' Championship. But because of all this squabbling, Michael lost over 30 seconds to Hackenham between joining the back of the three-car train and then when Damon finally pitted. If this race had happened today, Ralph might have actually helped his brother out because his Jordan blew up on lap 14 and in today's racing this would have brought out the safety car and this as well would have allowed Irvine to close up onto the back of Hakkinen, Schumacher to close up to the back of everybody else and then the Ulsterman would have had another crack at Mika but really Eddie was no threat to Mika during any point of this race. On lap 28, Esteban Tuero and Toro Takagi collided at the chicane, spitting debris all over the track, and Schumacher ultimately drove over this debris and it caused a slow puncture. His tyre would then explode just before entering Turn 1 with Irvine in his sights. It meant for that the second time in as many years, Michael would be stood at the side of the track, watching his title rival go round again, and again, and again. Only this time, it was 100% certain he'd be losing the title, as the previous year he needed that collision to retire Villeneuve as well to win. Whatever happened now, Hakkinen was world champion, much like the 1996 race when Villeneuve retired and Damon brought the car home in the lead. No more races in the season, no time for the drivers to catch back up, and it meant that Hakkinen would be Finland's first Formula 1 world champion since Keki Rosberg in 1982. Now as a bonus fact, Hakkinen was 30 when he won this world title his first world title of two, which by my calculations makes him the third oldest first time world champion since 1990. Because, you know, Nigel Mansell was 39, Damon Hill was 36, Mika was 30, and then Jensen Button was 29 when he won his. Bonus facts, as Simon Whistler would say. It was a very popular championship victory. Just three years prior to this, Hakkinen was in a coma in a South Australia hospital after suffering brain injuries in a crash in qualifying for the 1995 Australian Grand Prix. He'd managed to get fit again for the first race of 1996 and recovered through the season and was able to beat new teammate David Coulthard. Now, he was world champion. Stamps were issued in his native Finland and Hakkinen was now also a fan favourite across a lot of the F1 fanbase. I'd say even the most diehard of Schumacher fans were happy for him. The final results are on your screen. Mika controlled the race to win by 6 seconds from Irvine with Coulthard in 3rd. Damon was 4th after absolutely sending it on Frentzen at the chicane on the final lap and Villeneuve rounded out the point scoring places. Damon's last corner lunge that got him into 4th meant that Jordan beat Benetton to 4th in the Constructors' Championship. 12 drivers finished the race and McLaren secured what is still their latest championship. So this has been the story of the 1998 Japanese Grand Prix. If it's brought up some memories, or if you've learned something new here today, then do give the video one of these likes. Yeah, I'm really pushing it with Don Henley right now. But, you know, if you want to see more stuff like this, then do get subscribed and also get the bell on, so you never miss out on anything I do here. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help with the image purchasing, then you can help out by using the link in the description, or by using that super thanks thing. And if you want to see how my brain works outside of the YouTube world, there's my social media stuff in the description as well, along with a link to Discord. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.